Good evening, and uh, as always, it's fantastic to be back at Cambridge and uh, in the largest department in the university, the engineering department. A lot, any engineers over here this evening? Is home ground for you. Excellent. Well, I um, have been asked to, to share with you, within this fantastic course, um, at this stage of, of what you've been learning about entrepreneurship, what you've been introduced to about entrepreneurship, uh, is, is my experiences of building a business. And, and really, how do, you, how do you come up with an idea? How do you get that idea off the ground? And then the journey, what do you experience and what lessons do you learn on the journey? So just a little bit of background about me. I was born and brought up in India, born in a place called Hyderabad in, in, in South India, South Central India, one of the largest cities in India. I went to seven different schools. My father was in the Indian Army, so he got posted around a lot. And I ended up at a boarding school in, in Uti in, in South India, in the hill, Nilgiri Hills, 7,000 feet high. And uh, it's the last British boarding school left in India. The teachers are mainly expats. And uh, I think there may be an old boy in this room here somewhere. Their hands up, I think Amitabh's there, great. Uh, so you can, he'll correct me. Um, and one thing that was very special about the place is they tried to replicate England in every way. So it was up in the Nilgiri Hill, so it rained a lot. <laughs> and they went a bit too far because the food was English food at its worst. <laughs> boiled meat, which was like leather, boiled potatoes. It was just so bad, I don't know why. Um, Anyway, it's improved since then. And I get my revenge. I got my revenge for many years by holding the school reunion at one of the top Indian restaurants in London over here. So I went to university in India, to Hyderabad, the Smarn University, got my first degree at 19, and came over here to the UK, qualified as a chartered accountant with what is today Ernst & Young, and then came here and did a law degree. Uh, I was at Sydney Sussex College. Any Sydney people here? Any Sydney hands? Just a few, just a few. Okay, and then I started in business six months after I finished my studies. By this stage, I was 26 years old. And an idea. How do you come up with a business idea? The most business ideas, my experience, talking to other entrepreneurs, listening to other entrepreneurs. Any of you seen the film Social Network yet? Yeah, it's a brilliant film. If you haven't seen it, see it. Uh, now, in that film, it's a perfect, perfect example of what I'm about to tell you. Most business ideas are not something that's never existed before in terms of an invention as we imagine inventions are. They're actually usually, as a consumer, you come across an experience and you're so dissatisfied, you think, I can do this better in some way, I can do this differently in some way, maybe I can change the marketplace forever. Or another way of looking at it is, you're passionate about something on the one hand and you hate something on the other hand. For me, from the time I was allowed to drink, I love beer. And I came to this country as a 19-year-old and I immediately tried every beer I could. All oh, this is a great country, all the famous beer brands are available here, so I tried them all. And what I came across were lagers that were invariably fizzy and bland and bloating and harsh. It's terrible. I, mean, I can't name them, but probably the worst lager in the world. You know, that sort of beer. So um, I then was an English friend of mine introduced me to English bitter. Any English ale drinkers here? Yeah, I love ale. I love it. Love real ale to this day. I loved it, but then when I went to Indian restaurants, because I couldn't cook when I came here, so I used to go to Indian restaurants at least two or three times a week, and I would drink these cold, refreshing lagers, except that they were fizzy and harsh and bloating. Now, you combine sp spicy food with fizzy and harsh and bloating beer, uncomfortable. Then I tried ale. So I said, oh, the ale is smoother and easy to drink. I tried the ale with the Indian food, and it was too heavy and it was too bitter. And I said, what, what's going on here? All the ale drinkers are having a horrible experience. I'm having a horrible experience. The restaurateur could be selling me more beer and more food. And that's when the idea came up that one day I will create my own beer. It will have all the refreshing qualities of a lager, but the smoothness and the drinkability of an ale. 
and it'll go with all food, and in particular, Indian food. Simple, really simple. Why didn't somebody think of that before? And that's the beauty of innovation and entrepreneurial ideas, is people will always say, why didn't somebody think of that before? The Facebook film, those of you who've seen it, social networking sites were a dime a dozen when he started it in 2003. MySpace was already big news, but he did it differently. He did it better, and look where it is today. Now, it is an entrepreneurial journey, a tough journey. It's not easy. Um, those of you in this room who are, any of you already started your own business, run your own business? So you will all, I'm sure, vouch for the fact that it's tough and it's not easy. Um, my aim, right from the beginning, in, and uh, those of you who are at the judge at business school, you come across this term called B-H-A-G, B -H -A -G, big, hairy, audacious goal. Right? Look at this one. Um, to brew the finest ever Indian beer and make it a global beer brand. This is what I wanted to do when I started Cobra. Um, right, okay, who was I to say that? And the odds that were stacked against me, I had 20,000 pounds of student debt to pay off, which is now a common phenomenon. So you're gonna have debts to pay off. Nobody thinks you stand a chance. You think you're gonna get encouragement from your family, from your friends, invariably, they will try and get you on that straight and narrow path of a job. Um, my father, when I started Cobra, I went to Bangalore in India to, to set up the project. And I'll never forget this. I mean, he by now was the commander in chief of the Central Indian Army. And I used to go every time I got a bit of a break, I would go up and visit my family. And I thought I'd get some help from my family. I knew I couldn't get financial help because my father was an Indian Army officer. And Indian Army officers, particularly in those days, did not get paid very much. My father used to joke and say, look, you know, I never had to dissuade my sons from joining the army. All I did was show them my paycheck. <laughs> <laughs> and and, he, and you know, he would joke and say, ah, oh, my salary, he just pays for the mess bill. And so I knew no money from my father. Fair enough. At least I thought I'd get some emotional support, some moral support. You must be joking. What are you doing? All this education. <laughs> and you're becoming an import-export wala. <laughs> Get a proper job. Become a banker. We won't go there. We won't go there. Um, great job banking. Any bankers in the room? Wonderful, <laughs> wonderful. Um, so, you know, everyone says you don't stand a chance. And again, those of you at business school, if I had carried out Porter's market entry forces analysis, forget it. Across against every one of them. You know, this is the biggest beer market, one of the biggest beer markets in the world. It's really open. Anyone can start a beer business. Any one of you, tomorrow, go and start your own beer brand. No license required, no permissions required. You can do it. It's great about this country, open market. Huge competition, ancient competition. Stella Artois was founded in the 14th century. So, all the odds. Kingfisher. Oh, let's not forget Kingfisher. Great airline, by the way. Great airline. Kingfisher beer, biggest beer in, in uh, India. To this day, that company has over 50% market share of the Indian beer market. They had already been in the UK for eight years before we'd started. They were brewing in the UK and had Kingfisher on draft in thousands of Indian restaurants. So all the odds were totally, totally stacked. And of course, beer brands are famous for having huge budgets. Uh, marketing budgets. So you have all the odds stacked against you, but you've also got to have some things in your favor. If you, if you look at the Facebook story analogy, what was happening, um, you know, you have Web 1.0, Web 2.0, now we're coming to Web 3.0, but the whole Web 2.0 phase had started. And so he came into an area that the whole world was ready for and was growing although MySpace was already in existence. And then he rode with that wave and shot off the wave. In my case, in a much smaller example, you have here the growth of lager in this country. Today, if I took that to 2010, it would be 75% lager. 
what's happened? I mean, look, before I was born, 1% lager, 99% ale. I mean, we've, in effect, been globalized because everywhere else in the world, beer is lager. Um, the other phenomenon is, look at this. We are a nation of curryholics. <laughs> We're addicted to curry, emotionally and physically. <laughs> Come on, how many of you eat Indian food regularly? Yeah, it's just about everybody. Whatever age group, we all love Indian food. You know, they joke and say it's chicken tikka masala is a national dish of Britain. It doesn't even exist in India, by the way. That's another matter. <laughs> we call it butter chicken there. But, but this growth, and when I started Cobra, it was on that growth path. It had doubled in a decade. Yeah. So I had that in my favor. And of course, what's the most popular drink with Indian food? Beer. So although I had all the odds stacked against me, I had an idea for a product that was different and better. And I was in a growing sector of a market, lager beer, which Cobra is technically. And I was in a growing sector, which was Indian food. And my strategy was very simple. I would get Cobra onto the tables of the Indian restaurants because I didn't have that much competition there. And because I would have a bottle of beer imported from Bangalore and India, I would get people to discover my product on the restaurant tables. And then from there, one day, I'd get it on the supermarket shelves. And then one day, I would get it into the pubs. And I would start exporting it around the world. And I would make it a global beer brand. Quite a simple strategy. <laughs> yeah. Now, problem. How do you start when you've got no money? You have no money to even market. You have no money to advertise. My first item of marketing was a flimsy. It was actually slimmer than this because it's quite a few pages put together. It's thin cardboard, table card in green and black printing. We couldn't even afford full color printing, which my brother's advertising agency designed in India, which told us all about Kobo Beer, which I put on the restaurant tables. So how do, you, how do you start in business when you're in that position, when nobody knows you, nobody knows your product, you have zero credibility? I used to crave for some gray hairs so somebody could take me seriously. And why do people then supply you? Why do they finance you? Why do they buy from you when you have zero credibility? Nobody knows you, nobody knows your product. And I tell you what, I tell you that they do those things if you have, even in that position with all the odds stacked against you, complete faith and passion and belief in your product, in yourself, in your brand. And that passion and faith gives people the faith to trust you, to give you a chance. The owner of the brewery in Bangalore, Mr. Balan, and the brewmaster believed in my idea. Everyone else in the brewery laughed in my face saying, you don't stand a chance. All our competitors have tried and failed. Only Kingfisher has succeeded. And you've got no money, and you're young, and you know nothing about our industry. But these two individuals believed in me to the extent that when the first shipment of Cobra left Bangalore for the UK, the owner of the brewery lent me the money to pay him for the beer. <laughs> Can you imagine that? Then we would go around door to door in a battered Citroen de Chevaux called Albert, which cost 295 pounds. I borrowed it from my partner, Arjun Reddy, who I started the business with. And this car, I, one of my regrets in life is I wish I'd kept this car. Because it was, it was magical, I suppose. I mean, you, you drive along, you could see the road through the holes in the floor of the car. <laughs> Quite exciting. It needed push starting every day, so you got some exercise, you know, getting the car started. I'm not exaggerating anything. This is bright green and battered. You could carry exactly 15 cases of Cobra beer if you put some on the front seat as well, and the back seat, and the sloping boot. Um, and we would park it a little bit ahead of the restaurant so they didn't see the delivery vehicle of the most expensive ever Indian beer. Then we'd walk into the restaurant and say, here we are, best ever Indian beer. Extra smooth, less gassy, perfect with Indian food. Try some. Sorry, we don't drink. Two-thirds of the Indian restaurants are actually owned and run by Bangladeshis, Muslims. The other one-third, Pakistanis, Muslims. Nepalese, Sri Lankans, Indians, a lot of them are Muslims. So a lot for religious reasons wouldn't drink. 
And then I learned one of my first lessons in business. They said, it doesn't matter that we don't drink. It's our customers that matter. If your product is as good as you say that it is, leave a couple of bottles. We'll try it out with our regular customers. If they like it, we'll put in our first order. If our wider customers like it, you will get your reorder. And then you're given that chance. And I'll never forget that chance that the restaurateurs gave me. And that's when your product has to perform. And from day one, we got almost a 100% reorder rate. That's all the confidence you need. And all I dreamt of from that day on was is how can I now replicate those reorders and extrapolate them around the world. And that gets you off the ground. So the customer coming first. Now, it took six years for us to actually get this brand to take off. In the meantime, and my partner left the business in 1995. He didn't think the plane would take off. I bought him out and they took on some, um, raised some more money, put some money into marketing. Marketing, when I say marketing, not advertising, glasses and things. Took on a team, built on a really good team, which made a huge difference. In 1996, our sales took off. Great. Indian restaurants started selling it more and more. Big bottles of Cobra, small bottles of Cobra, going really well, really well. And then when our sales doubled, our problems of importing Cobra beer from India quadrupled. Because suddenly now we crossed over 100 containers a year and the brewery couldn't cope. The brewery was doing fantastically well in India. Consistency problems, quality problems, containers getting stuck. And we were building a premium beer brand. It was really expensive. So now what do we do? I built up this brand as an authentically imported Indian beer and I've got all these problems. One solution would be to brew the beer here in the UK. So I asked some of my distributors and wholesalers, what, what, what if I do that? Finished, you're finished. You're just like every other beer. You do that and you're out. I said, but what? I was stuck in between a rock and a hard place. So then I remember the first lesson I'd ever learned. And that was the consumer. I did a survey in London, BBC Good Food Show, Sunday Time Show in Birmingham, thousands of consumers and asked them, what's the most important thing about Cobra Beer to you? Rank and order of importance, four things, and I'll try and remember them. That it's a brutal and authentic Indian recipe. That it's a premium lager beer. That it's got an extra smooth, less gassy taste. That it's imported from India. And I jumbled it up, no bias. Most important thing to the consumer, by a long shot. Extra smooth, less gassy taste. Least important thing to the consumer, by a long shot, imported from India. I'm brewing here. <laughs> so, born in Bangalore, brewed in Bedford. <laughs> and all my problems were over overnight. World-class quality, world-class packaging, consistency, availability at my doorstep. And on top of that, I could brew Cobra on draft and deliver it on draft. So we had draft beer, which we could never bring from India. So it shows how you can turn a problem on this journey, huge problem that nearly destroyed my business, into an advantage. And you have to have faith in the consumer. Now, moving forward, I then embarked on lifelong learning. I suddenly woke up you know, eight years after having started in business uh, and realized that you've got to keep learning. So I started a business growth program at a business school down the road. Um, and I then decided to invest in our first mainstream advertising campaign, which was going very well. Everything was going swimmingly. And then, out of the blue, out of the blue, you hit something that comes from nowhere. The restaurants boycotted Cobra. Why? Because I'd started a magazine. Now again, when you're on this path, you will learn this, those of you who are studying the psychology of business and entrepreneurship. When you're on a path trying to build a business, trying to build a brand, and you know where you want to get to, you suddenly start seeing opportunities you wouldn't normally see before. It's like, you know, if you, if you suddenly decide to buy a red Ferrari, you will spot more red Ferraris around that you normally may have driven past. It's that sort of psychology. So when we were building the brand, 
we realized that it was very difficult to communicate with these nearly 10,000 Indian restaurants around the country. They were all independent, very few chains, and in those days there was no internet, so you couldn't sort of mass email people. Mail shops were really expensive and pretty laborious, postage, printing, etc. So we said, let's advertise in a trade magazine that goes out to all the Indian restaurants regularly. There wasn't one, so I started one called Tandoori. And Tandoori to this day is the leading trade magazine in the Indian restaurant sector. It goes out to all the Indian restaurants every two months, giving them information, write-ups, reviews, and advertisers from all sectors of supply Indian restaurants, including other beer brands. And I started this magazine with a friend of mine, and eventually I stepped back when the magazine was running itself, and we just became an advertiser, and I was a part owner of it and the publisher. My editor wrote an article in Tandoori magazine in 1998, which upset the restaurants. He criticized the service in Indian restaurants in a very hurtful way, which hurt the restaurants. And he took a swipe at the waiters, who he said looked miserable, and he'd used language which was terrible. He said the waiters were so bad because the managers and owners didn't incentivize them, so he took a swipe at the owners and managers. The restaurants were up in arms, understandably so. I knew nothing about it. It's like Rupert Murdoch, does he read every issue of the Times? No. So, so I was shown this after it had been sent out to the restaurants. By now, it had become a national scandal. Tandoori magazine was on every TV station, every radio, newspaper, all over. The restaurants then were up in arms. They started burning Tandoori magazine. The, the editor received 10 death threats. I mean, it was, we laugh at it now, but it was horrible at the time. My, uh, my staff were in tears. Through no fault of Cobra, they suddenly realized, ah, this magazine's free circulation so they can keep posting it out to us. But Karen Billamoria, he's one of the owners, will boycott Cobra Beer. And Cobra Beer, through no fault, was boycotted. What do you do then? You can cry, you can put your head in the sand, but you've got to get out of it. At that stage, we had scaled up a small company to 120 people. We'd started opening up depots around the country, in Leeds, in Birmingham, in Manchester, in Scotland. We'd taken on our own vans, depots, going beautifully, mainstream advertising campaign. I was on this business course. Things couldn't have been better. Sales growing at 70% a year. And this comes out of the blue. So I had to scale down from 120 people to 17 people within a matter of months, which broke my heart. We had to cut our costs, and we had to survive. And we had to go around from restaurant to restaurant, convincing them of our innocence. It took one year for that boycott to be withdrawn. And after that, we put our foot on the accelerator and started growing again. But it shows that if you don't adapt, you die. And some of those decisions are really tough, really hard, and quite often it happens with no warning whatsoever. Things go on. Everything's growth going fantastically well. Took on a new management team in, in the, um, to about three, four years ago now. Everything going fantastically well. And we decided to start brewing a few years ago in Europe as well, in Poland. We were able to brew in Poland, bring it to the UK, cheaper than brewing it in the UK, and we were spreading our risk of production. We also started brewing in Belgium. We then started carrying on brewing in Bedford. Again, suddenly, South African breweries, one of the biggest brewers in the world, <coughs> took over our Polish brewery, which at this stage was accounting for a huge chunk of our production. And overnight, they said, well, we've got a contract. We'll fulfill the contract, but we'll only do it because we have to, so find another brewer fast. We had to find another brewer. Now, again, human tendency. I went to a talk by the Dalai Lama. Any of you ever heard the Dalai Lama speak? Yeah? Inspirational? I went out of curiosity. I found it absolutely inspirational. One of the messages I'll never forget, he said, when you're confronted with a problem in life, keep a wider perspective. Keep an open mind. Our human tendency is to go straight into the problem and not look beyond it. Paolo Coelho's book, The Alchemist, any of you read that? Yeah? The moral of the story? You got that issue, that challenge, the problem, and it's right under your very nose. We immediately looked for another brewer in Poland. Oh, well, we can think a little wider than that. Let, let's look at other Eastern European countries. And with the help of our Belgian brewmaster, 
we actually came up with a production model that brought all our brewing back on shore to the UK in Hartlepool, in Liverpool, with a packaging plant in Cheshire, with this ultra-modern packaging plant. We manufacture bottles and you bottle and you warehouse and you distribute from one giant plant with Swiss, German and Swedish technology and a British workforce and Irish investment. That's why we're a global country. And you know what, by that, through that new model, what turned out to be a huge problem of losing our Polish production, we were actually able to do it even cheaper, bringing it over here and really efficiently. So again, it's a question of turning these crises into advantages. Now, just to give you an idea of the growth of Cobra until a phase that I'm going to be talking about. Very high growth. That little print there is not to test the eyesight of all of you sitting at the back there. I'm just making a point. The point is that I started with no money and had to raise money all the way. And we decided that to try and preserve our equity, our shareholding, so after my partner left, I in effect had 95% of the business and I had one angel investor who put in 5% for 50,000 pounds in 1993. And the rest of it, we raised through different forms of finance. To this day, you get, if I ask those of you who started your own businesses, how you raised your finance, you do surveys in this country. Overdraft is by far the number one form of finance. Sure enough, I started with an overdraft as well. And then it goes down to bank loans, maybe equity. But there is a range of finance available depending on what business you're in. In our case, we use different forms of trade finance, negotiable instruments like bills of exchange, Victorian instruments. We, we can talk about that later. Um, we use uh, invoice finance, factoring before invoice finance. Uh, and we use different forms of pre uh, preference shares, convertible preference shares, redeemable preference shares, um, all in a way of preserving our equity. But what happened as a result of that was that we were highly leveraged. In 2006, um, I got into the House of Lords. Brand, as you could see, was really flying. And that's when um, a big hedge fund said, OK, you're doing really well. You've started television advertising. You really want to take this brand to the next stage? Well you need lots more money. So the highest amount of money we'd raised at that stage, if you look at this graph, was about 7 million pounds of convertible preference shares. They said, we'll give you 33 million pounds in two chunks in 2006 and 7. And it's an instrument that's a loan and some share warrants, and this will allow you to really take off. But here are the conditions. First, you, the entrepreneur, step aside and be the chairman. Bring in a professional chief executive, bring in a brand new marketing director, bring in a brand new commercial director, revamp your whole team, take on many more people, and go for it, which is what we did. And we went for it, invested in all this, and actually realized to implement the new chief executive's plans, we needed to raise even more money. And then what happened in 2006, what we hadn't realized at this stage, was the subprime crisis had already started unfolding in the United States. By 2007, when we're in this fundraising mode, credit crunch started to bite. Funding dried up. And by 2008, we had a major drinks company who wanted to come in as a minority shareholder and investor. They pulled out two weeks before Lehman's went bust. And then the world collapsed. Luckily, I was able to take a loan on a personal guarantee for a huge amount that saved the business. And then the decision was made that we had to go into a sale process. Rothschilds were our advisors, and we went through a sale process starting after Lehman's went bust. Great timing. Timing is everything. But we really didn't have much of a choice. And by this stage, we had huge debts, but we had a brand that was very valuable. A brand that had been valued on an equity basis in 2006 with money raised equity value, not the debt, of 80 million pounds, 80 million pounds. And suddenly, the value of growth evaporated. 
And in this sale process, we struggled and struggled and struggled. It went on into the spring of 2009 last year. And luckily, 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 Molson Coors, one of the largest brewers in the world, who were a prime acquirer, came to us and said, we don't want to acquire you. We want to do a joint venture with you. We will invest in you on the conditions that you, Karen Billamoria, stay on as chairman. I said, I'm delighted. I never wanted to sell. OK, how long do you want me here for? 10 years. It's fine. This is my baby. I love it. I'll be here. Will some of your team come with you? Yep, they come. We want 50.1% so we can consolidate it into our accounts. New York Stock Exchange listed company, multi-billion dollar global group. So that's fine, but in every other way, joint venture. We want operational control, so there's clarity. We'll put in the managing director, but you're the chairman of the board. I said, that's fine, it's clean, it's clear. And we will finance it from here onwards. Now here's the catch. We will pay enough. We will pay enough so all the employees who we don't take on are looked after, who leave. Full notice periods, full payoff. But we have to restructure your highly leveraged company. We went in for a company voluntary arrangement where you have to get 75% of your creditors to agree. We got 90% of our creditors to agree. By now, it's May last year. 22nd of May, a document this sake prepared by all the lawyers, advisors, accountants, about to be submitted into court, and that was a Friday. On the Thursday, in came a statutory demand to close the business down from one of our major creditors. The whole company voluntary arrangement was destroyed immediately. Molson Co. said, that's it, it's over. The company, I nearly lost the company on that day. And there was one other way to do it. The only other way, the only option we had otherwise we'd have just lost the company, was to go down a route called a prepack administration. Molson Coors, to their credit, said, fine, if that's the only option, we will stick by what we said the deal was, but you have to go through the prepack. And we had PricewaterhouseCoopers doing it for us with Rothschilds. They had to go back to every single person who was interested in buying Cobra beer, all the major brewers in the world, and said, right, we're going through a prepack. Any one of you can bid for the business. The joint venture, which included Molson Coors and me, were bidding as well. It took a week. In that week, I could have lost the business. Anyone could have outbid us. And the Friday following that, the joint venture won the bid. And I got my business. I saved my business. I saved the brand. I saved a lot of people. But the result of a prepack administration is that technically, technically in that position, and this is the sad thing, it's got a very bad reputation in this country, is that people do it deliberately to wipe out their employees, wipe out their shareholders, wipe out their creditors, and start again the same business in the same way, quite often the same premises, as if nothing's happened with a clean sheet of paper. In my case, it was a brand new way of doing the business with a joint venture with a large global group. In my case, I was able to look after the employees. I've committed to taking on my shareholders, I've almost finished paying off all my secured creditors, and I've committed to settle the unsecured creditors as best as I can going forward. It's a horrible experience. The press, who'd been very kind to me, suddenly attacked me. It was awful. Pictures of me with my wife in the Sunday Times. They even bring your family into it. Suddenly, the people who've been so nice to you will turn on you. And it was the most nightmarish experience that I went through but we came through and we clutched victory from the jaws of defeat. So now I see it as my responsibility going forward to settle everyone as best as I can going forward. It may take me many years, and at the end of it, I believe I'll have a more valuable business in the long run. It may take quite a long time, it may take a few years. Already, it's proving to be very successful as a business. Um, so the sale turned into the joint venture. Now, why is this joint venture working? One and a half years down the road, I can say the joint venture is working. And I remember when I just signed it, and it was all over the press, and I bumped to one of my colleagues, um, Lord Putnam, David Putnam, you know, the film producer who produced Chariots of Fire? He said, oh, Karen, joint ventures, they never work. They only work if the cultures are aligned. And luckily, 
We have this family-owned. Pete Coors is still the chairman of Molson Coors from the family, 19th century. The Molson family go back to the 18th century. It's a family-controlled global beer group, this New York Stock Exchange listed. The cultures have worked. The principles are great, and they're great people to work with with shared values. Now, one of the decisions they made was to go back to basics. So Cobra is now going back to, for the last one and a half years, the best beer to drink with curry. That first ever advertising campaign that I told you about in 1998, that's what it looked like, created by Saatchi and Saatchi. You know, that was our spokesperson, Curryholic Dave. Um, and you know, the beer from Bangalore that lets you eat more curry. The beer Curryholics adored lets them eat more. The less classy, less gassy, more classy Curryholics beer, blah, blah, blah. Very successful. So now we've gone back to best beer to drink with Indian food. So you may have seen this, it's in the Times and in, in London in the Evening Standard and Metro and various things. Back to love curry, love cobra. Less fizz to go perfectly with curry. And that's working very well. Less fizz to go perfectly with curry. So just very focused. Marks and Spencer's now sell branded products. So it's, this was with them. Um, and different executions of this completely curry, cobra, curry, curry and cobra. Um, you know, over-ordering cobra curry breakfast. <laughs> uh, and I'm going to conclude, one of the reasons that Molson Coors did this deal is not all about me. They said, you have what we term an extraordinary brand. And they have six boxes that you have to tick to be an extraordinary brand. Whatever business you're in, I do believe more and more you're building brands. And the six criteria of what makes an extraordinary brand is one, tells a compelling story that is based on an undeniable brand truth. And in, in our case with Cobra Beer, what is our brand truth? And I think the brand truth goes right back to less gassy, extra smooth, goes perfectly with Indian food, and actually is really drinkable. So it's that texture and taste of the product that, that is, separates it from other products that is our brand truth that has to deliver every time. Um, live by and refuse to compromise on their principles. I hope from what you've heard in my telling you the Cobra story that has come across. Have an instantly recognizable look. You can all picture a bottle of Cobra, can't you? So yellow, green, brown bottle, embossed bottle, iconic look. You've got to have that in some way. Example here is absolute vodka. Deliver a unique, relevant, consistent experience. We've talked about that less gassy, extra smooth taste in an Indian restaurant. You have a Cobra beer, it's there. It's absolutely unique, relevant, and works. A brand that inspires people to become loyal brand champions. This is known uh, as, as Kevin Roberts, who's been an entrepreneur in residence over here, the head of Saatchi and Saatchi. He's got this whole theme of love marks. And what are love mark brands? What are brands where people will die for them out of loyalty? Where they just so look for those brands? And the way I would express this is, you go to an Indian restaurant, you sit down at the Indian restaurant, waiter brings you the menus, you open the menus, and you decide what you're going to eat. And he says, uh, what would you like to drink? And you say, uh, two cobras, please. Sorry, sir, no cobras. You put the menus down, you walk out of the restaurant. Because it's ruined your experience. And you find an Indian restaurant that has Cobra. So that's loyal brand champions. And then that deliver enduring, extraordinary profits. And you could say it's a mistake that I made, but it was a deliberate strategy that I was going for growth, with very good gross margins, but sacrificing the bottom line profit and highly leveraged. Now we're in a position where we're demonstrating a brand that is delivering very, very good profits. So that six box, which I didn't tick when I was running it, I'm now in a position to tick. So that's an extraordinary brand for you. And, and so the, the conclusion is this, JV will work if it's a true partnership. It is now the best of both worlds, giant multinational with an entrepreneurial company. And this is our vision, to aspire and achieve 
against all odds with integrity. That is almost a definition of entrepreneurship. Think about it. Aspire, you've got an idea, you want to get somewhere with that idea. You've invariably got no means or little means. You've invariably got all the odds stacked against you. And you go out there and you make it happen. And you try and do it with integrity. The only thing is I've changed my vision. I've changed it now, slightly. Because it's no longer against all the odds. <laughs> Thank you very much. Any other lawyers in this room? Yeah? Law is a very uh, business-related degree. Think about it. I mean, in my case, my perfect career choice with a degree in commerce from India, chartered accountancy and a law degree, M&A, corporate finance, doors open. So it's very good for business, going into business. I mean, law is a very tough degree, those of you who've done it. It's not an easy degree. It's not, a, not an easy way out. There's no shortcut to, to hard work in law. But I think what I learned, each degree, I feel, whatever discipline you go into, actually teaches you something that you can apply in life, not just in that particular degree. I'll tell you what I'll never forget from law. I can't remember any of the cases. I can't remember any of, forget it. I mean, you, know, you remember it for the exam, and then you forget it. Um, <laughs> but it, what I will never forget is the way when, you, as a, a, in a law, typical law question is, A does this to B, C sees this, D is involved, advise A, B, C, and D. And it's invariably a practical situation, a real life situation where you've got to give advice. And to be able to give that advice is not just using your common sense. You've got to look at textbooks. You look at what judges have said. You've got to look at legal journals. You've got to look at previous cases. You've got to look at statute. And this range of information. And then you've got to narrow it down and apply it to a practical situation and come up with a decision to be able to think widely and narrow down and focus and apply. Wow. It's worth doing it just for that. <laughs> so every course you do, there's going to be some benefit. And by the way, education on the whole, I think we're so lucky. It's a huge benefit, whatever you're studying. I mean, whether you, if you study history, the ability to study history and write great essays, it's a great skill to be able to take in huge amounts of information, whatever subject you're doing. It doesn't matter. You can study anything and start a beer business or start an IT business, or whatever. It really doesn't matter what, what you've studied. You can apply it, yeah? Uh, social media is now more and more absolutely um, integral. So talk about Facebook. We have a, a Curry Lovers site, um, and that has almost 100,000 members. And you know, we spon sponsor National Curry Week, which is coming up later this month. And a lot of it is linked around our uh, activity in, in social media. I, and I think we should be doing much more of it. And it never ceases to amaze me the way um, viral things just catch on, um, sometimes quite illogically. Um, and my children are the best barometer for that. They're constantly coming to say, Daddy, Daddy, have you seen this? Have you seen this? It's, it's, and it's crazy stuff that, that, that you never know what's going to just fly. And, and I can just remember, I think I was about to join the House of Lords, when YouTube was first launched. And the person who was the chairman of the Television Society of Britain told me at a lunch in Berkshire, I'll never forget it, saying, oh, you must look at this thing called New YouTube. It's amazing. You can watch films and things. on." I said, what? He said, yeah. And it just took off. These things are happening so quickly, and, and we're just, in many ways, at the beginning of it. And, and that's a very good question. So th this is the advantage of, of focus and what if you spread yourself too thin. So in the early days, that whole thing about getting into the Indian restaurants, getting on the table, getting discovered on the table, and, and you know, you use your points of difference all the time. So for example, we imported in the big 650 ml bottles. You know Cobra, the big bottles? You're all familiar with the Cobra double-sized bottles? Initially, those were the only, because in India, even now, 95% of beer is sold in big bottles, in a single size and shape, because all the bottles are recycled. So that was a huge disadvantage, because the restaurant said, we don't know anything about these big bottles. Give us small bottles of draft. We couldn't. 
that's all we had. We turned it into an advantage. And we said, look, restaurant owners, one, it's double size, so double the sales. So you make double sales, double profit. Leave the bottles on the table, the customers will help themselves, so waiters can get on and do other things. Oh, customers will end up sharing. And as long as they're not driving, they might even drink more beer. And they share your Indian food. Don't you, when you order Indian food, you order dishes for the table and people share. And what's going to happen, people at other tables are going to say, what are they drinking? It looks like a bottle of wine. Oh, what is it? A bottle of oh, I'll order some. It spreads like wildfire around the restaurant. So suddenly, you've, and you've got your brand on the table. What an advantage. My friends own Tilda Rice, great rice brand. Do you know that it's Tilda Rice that you're eating? My friends own Patek's Pickles, great product. Do you know in that dish where there's Patek's Pickle? You know it's a bottle of beer, Cobra beer. So you get your brand in front of people and that strategy of building and that association with the Indian food experience. But my biggest worry has always been, does that box us into a corner and we can't go beyond Indian food? I believe what is happening, I come across more and more people, maybe some of you in this room, who say I have Cobra beer in my fridge at home and I just drink it because I love the beer. Not when necessarily when I'm having Indian food, but the origins were Indian food. Another example, Land Rover, Range Rover, now owned by Tata's, Indian company. One of my roles is I'm president of the UK India Business Council, and it's amazing the work that's going on between now, the investment between the two countries. But an Indian company, Tata's, owns Jaguar Land Rover. Now with Land Rover, if you look at all the Land Rover adverts, go beyond in Africa, deserts, jungles, forests. 90% of the driven on motorways. <laughs> yeah? So go beyond curry. <laughs> and, 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 and this feeling, especially when you first start, you don't want to tell anyone about it, and you're scared somebody's going to take your idea from you, and you're very secretive about it. Um, and yes, I think you must try and protect, especially if you're coming up with something that is a, a new scientific discovery or you know, if you can protect it in any way through IP, through registering a patent, you should. With beer, unfortunately, you can't register a beer patent because it's so easy to change the recipe. It's impossible to protect in practical terms. So I knew I couldn't. But the trademark, trademark you register very, very quickly and very carefully and protect that with a vengeance. Um, and so, but then you realize very quickly, once you've started doing things, the world is so transparent now that everyone knows everything anyway. So if you think you're going to get ahead by hiding something, chances are you're gonna, that can last for only so long. In the end, people will try and copy you. There's so many beers now that call themselves extra smooth, you know, um, and try and co literally copy Cobra Bear's taste. There's a new beer that's been launched that literally says extra smooth Indian oil. So you can't stop people copying you. Um, so that's why you've got to always stay one step ahead. That's why you've got to constantly innovate and constantly be ahead of the game. And, and whether it's your marketing, whether it's your packaging, whether it's the way you sell, whether it's expanding, whether it's new products, that fantastic graph that you have, matrix, um, that in, again, at the business school, you've seen the matrix of uh, existing products, new products, existing markets, new markets. Um, you know, it's classic that you, you have to constantly be thinking in, in, in those terms to stay ahead of the game. Right, now this is something I have a, a lot of experience in. My first partner, Arjun Reddy, who I started the business with, again, you look at most, every success, almost without fail, successful business story, it starts as a partnership. Because I really could not have done it on my own. There's no way. Um, you do need somebody else, and that somebody else ideally should be complementary. So Arjun, my partner, was much more streetwise than I was. He was much more um, negative than I was. So he was a good balance. He would hold me back, and I would feel he's holding me back too much. But that's good. So if you have complementary people, it's better than having two of the same who fight against each other. So that's the ideal situation, and we, we remain great friends since then. I mean, he's moved to the States, and we, we're in regular touch, and we've stayed great friends. So you look at the Facebook story. Uh, that's not a very nice. Uh, but again, they started as partners. 
You look at Bill Gates, Paul Allen, started as partners. You look at Richard Branson, if you read Richard Branson's, I've spoken to Murray personally, started with a partner. Uh, invariably, one will stay the course. It'll be the Branson who stays it, or the Gates who stays it, or the Zuckerman who stays it, but they start as partners. Then, in my case, you evolve and you go further, and now I'm in a partnership globally with a giant group. Now, I couldn't have been lucky because I've chosen, have I chosen, it happened. Wonderful partners. Why? Because of their culture that I talked about, because of their values. Every way, and that permeates through the whole company. So if you've got people you can trust, and I trust them completely, we don't always agree, but we're open with each other, and then we make a decision and move on. You know, they have operational control over the business day to day. Twice in the last 18 months, only twice, have I had to say to the managing director, you know, I can only advise you. I can't force you to do it. It's up to you what you want to do. Both times, he listened to my advice. So you work together, and you make it happen. And if you trust each other, trust is the most important thing. And I'll never forget in Bangalore, I was at the races. Mr. Balan, the owner of the brewery, taking me to the Bangalore races that were being sponsored by his brewery. Great day out. And I was sitting next to a really, really big tycoon in Bangalore. And he said, sit down next to me, young man. I'll give you some advice. So he gave me some advice. And I'll never forget, he said, said, young man, empires are built on trust. So there we are. Hope that answers your question. <laughs>